Last week, we saw the fall of Shaka. We saw Dingane meet his end at the hands of his half-brother, Mapande. And we saw the Zulu and the Dutch come to an uneasy truce when Mapande allied with them to overthrow his brother. This week, we'll see how European and native relations evolve as the 19th century moves on. But before we can talk about how the Europeans and the indigenous peoples of South Africa interacted, we have to take a closer look at the Europeans who were there. Who were they? Why were they there? What relation did they have to one another? Well, this isn't quite as straightforward as you might think. The two principal powers at play here were the English and the Dutch, but why they're both there and who they're loyal to is about to get complicated. You see, back in 1652, the Dutch, under the Dutch East India Company, first settled Cape Town and sort of lay claim to South Africa. But that was like 150 years before our story started. We're looking at the late 18th and early 19th century here. And what was happening in Europe in the late 18th and early 19th century? Right, Napoleon. During the French Revolution, French armies conquered the Dutch Republic, and the ruler of the Dutch Republic, the Prince of Orange, fled to Britain and asked them to take over his colonies so they wouldn't fall into the hands of the rampaging French. This left the Dutch in South Africa in a strange state of limbo. They were now ruled by the British, but were citizens of a nation which no longer existed and might never come back for them. Many of the Dutch colonists chafed under British rule, and as the British began to expand their colonial efforts far more actively than the Dutch ever had, Dutch settlers began to move into the previously uncolonized interior of the country to escape British expansion. And in doing so, they started to see themselves as independent, neither British nor Dutch, but rather as a part of their own South African nation, who I'm going to refer to as the Boers from now on, since that's how they referred to themselves. As they moved inland, the Boers began to set up their own republics on native territory, often Zulu territory. This created tension in the region that would eventually escalate to the extremity of violence. But for right now, European politics in South Africa really was a matter of the British wanting to limit the power and influence of the Boers, and the Boers wanting to assert their independence and ensure that the British didn't eventually assimilate all of South Africa. But the Boers were limited in number. They weren't exactly getting a large influx of immigrants from the country they'd declared independence from. And South Africa wasn't a primary British concern. So who did the Boers try to use as both pawns and proxies for their struggle? The local people, the Zulus. Okay, so back to the Zulus. Mapande is usually considered a weak king. I think this might be a little unfair, but he was certainly less warlike than his relatives. He negotiated a treaty defining borders with the British, and then gave additional lands to the Boers. But the British weren't just going to let the Boers expand, so this is where the British really started to encroach on Zulu sovereignty. They claimed that the land given to the Boers was in violation of the treaty the Zulus had made with them, and pressured Mapande into retaking the area. Thereafter, Mapande attempted to navigate the tightrope of keeping both the Boers and the British happy but he knew he'd need a buffer between him and the Europeans. So, in the 1850s, he decided to launch an invasion into Swaziland to secure himself from Boer encroachment. The British, though, saw this expansion as a threat, and once again forced him out of his gains, compelling him to abandon the territory he'd just won. During this campaign in Swaziland, it became very clear that Mapande's son, Chetswayo, was a vigorous and capable leader. And here's something strange happens. Chetswayo just sort of slides into power without killing Mapande. That's not to say that there was no violence. After all, one of Mapande's other sons was also jockeying for power, as the Zulus became less content with Mapande's concessions to the British. Chetswayo invaded the other son's territory and defeated both him and a small contingent of his British allies. Remarkably, he let the British go and began a new diplomatic policy that aimed at keeping peace with both the colonial powers while giving far less away to the Europeans than Mapande had. Then, somebody discovered diamonds in the area. This always screws things up. European miners started pouring into South Africa, and with them, shopkeepers, tool traders, geologists, and all the other support personnel that a major mineral rush needs. But it was never enough. The demand for labor outpaced even the flood of fortune seekers coming to South Africa, and so the European mining firms began to look hungrily at the native population. For the most part, the Zulus and the surrounding tribes were content. Working a diamond mine is unpleasant. The Zulu already had all they needed with their farms and their cattle, and now with all these essentially unproductive Europeans flooding in, the Zulu could get a pretty good price for any surplus food they grew. This led mining conglomerates to offer guns for labor, and the British government to start taking more drastic steps toward expansion. The British wanted to secure any potential diamond mines they could, which meant pushing into native and Boer territory at an unheard of rate. At the same time, the British also wanted to start consolidating their hold over South Africa in general, and to integrate the outlying tribes with the growing diamond economy. Doing this basically meant destroying the traditional South African way of life, and stepping on agreements made with the Boers. 
But the funny thing is, while the British government wanted to make all this happen, their local South African ruling government, especially in Cape Town, wanted nothing to do with it. Britain needed to bring them in line. Thus enters Henry Bartle Freya. Freya had once been an ardent civil servant for the British in India. He had done notable service during the Indian Rebellion, and had risen to be governor of Bombay. He'd been noticed by the Conservative Secretary of State for the colonies, Lord Carnarvon, whose big project was to confederate many of the British colonies. Carnarvon had just successfully done so with Canada, and now he was dead set on doing the same with South Africa. Carnarvon had Freya appointed High Commissioner of South Africa, and promised that he would become the first Governor General there, a position that almost certainly came with a peerage, if he could bring the entire area under British control and set up an effective government. Freya agreed, and began to assess what he would need to do in order to achieve this. His solution was basically annex and suppress everybody, but he especially noted the need to break the power of the Zulus. The local political elite tried to warn him that, with the recent British expansion, tensions were high, and any minor event might throw the whole region into war. But Freya was having none of that, and began looking for an opportunity to expand. His first chance came from a minor tribal skirmish between two outlying tribes. How minor? Well, it started as a bar fight. That didn't stop Freya from using the incident as cause to declare war on one of the tribes, against the vociferous objections of the local Cape Colony government. The Cape government succeeded in at least making sure that their local, fast, light commando troops prosecuted the war, rather than the might of the British Royal Army. The war was swift and decisive, but the Cape government had no interest in annexation, and so returned the land to the native people. Freya, furious over this, basically used this act of insubordination to have them effectively removed from power, and have himself granted total governmental control over South Africa. Shortly after this, he enacted a law that demanded that all native Africans had to give up their guns. Not Europeans, mind you, just the native Africans. Well, nobody was falling for that one. The native tribes were far smarter than Freya gave them credit for, and rose in revolt rather than give up their arms. This time, Freya unleashed the mighty British Imperial Army. But, being unfamiliar with the terrain, not accustomed to the weather, and burdened by their heavier armaments, the British army couldn't even find the rebels, much less beat them. Finally, Freya called back in the local frontier commando troops of the Cape Colony government he'd just overthrown, and the commandos managed to engage and defeat some of the rebelling tribesmen. While this allowed Freya to annex their land, it sent much of the rest of South Africa into a guerrilla war that would nearly bankrupt Cape Colony. But this wouldn't stop Bartle Freya. He saw the escalating conflict simply as an expedient. Now, the British government as a whole didn't actually want a war with the native peoples of South Africa, but Carnarvon, who had appointed Freya, was an opponent of the current government, and he did. If the tribes rose up, it made going to war with them and eventually annexing their land much simpler politically. And so, with that in mind, Freya finally went after the crown jewel of South Africa, Zululand. On December 11th, 1878, Freya sent an ultimatum to Chetswayo, the Zulu king, demanding that he disband his armies entirely and accept a British observer into his court. He gave Chetswayo one month to comply. These demands were impossible. Needless to say, on January 11th, 1879, the British and the Zulu Empire were at war. Join us next time for the Anglo-Zulu War, the battle that raised the Zulu to an almost mythic status in Western lore, and the final fates of both Chetswayo and Bartle Freya.